Hello, my friend. Welcome back to the Mindset Check Podcast. I'm your host, Misha McKittrick. This is a podcast where we believe that as you take time for a mindset check, you have more power than you think you do. And where we also believe that as we learn to listen and as we learn how to imagine our future, we create different possibilities and we're actually in tune with a more direct path towards where we're going. We're going to chat all about that today. I want to just say, holy bananas, what kind of season are you in? (laughs) For a lot of us, we're in the middle of our kids, you know, ending up the school year and kind of moving into summer and switching seasons. For me, I'm in the middle of a couple of graduations. One is happening this week, and that's my senior graduating from high school. And there's a lot of emotion inside of that. There's a lot of things I do. Oh, that bring up extra emotion, like really reminiscing and creating videos of his, you know, growing up years and all of that stuff for us to reminisce and drop in about. And I'm really looking forward to doing that and spending time there. And another one of the graduations was for my youngest, who is graduating from a charter school. And I just have to share something with you from that graduation that we went to today. I thought it was so poignant and so beautiful, and it, it moved me to tears immediately. And this girl from his class was giving a speech and she said, hey, how many of you remember, and she said, you know, when the something ship sank, like, do you remember the exact date and year? If you can remember that, raise your hand. And it was like really sparse. Maybe a couple of hands went up and she's like, okay, look, if you don't remember that, don't worry. I just wanted to also ask you, how many of you will never forget looking in Miss Crawford's mirror every single day and saying something good about yourself. And every hand shot up. Wow. (laughs) I immediately started crying and I just was so, so grateful for those moments that they get to experience and for a teacher who creates an environment where they are encouraged to love themselves. That was emotional and moving for me. And I thought it's also such a motivating thing for all of us to make sure that we're looking in the mirror and talking to ourselves that same way. As far as the podcast goes, if you are brand new to listening today, welcome. I'm so thrilled that you're here. If you're new for context, the first season we started reading from my journal and we kind of started to get the trajectory of how my life was going. And we're now getting a little glimpse of my husband, my current husband and his trajectory and his life and how our lives are meeting up. So it's an incredible journey where we just get to talk about life and all the things that come up in life and how much we're all just moving forward and putting it together and shedding light on the things that we experience so that we can learn and grow. I'm happy that you're here, and if you have a desire to go back and listen, there's a lot of juicy stuff. (laughs) So it is chronological order. If you go back, you might just want to start at episode one and listen all the way through. Or you can just stay with us and get a glimpse of what this podcast feels like today. Without any further ado, let's jump in to Jake's junior year. Reflections, junior year. Another year, over with, gone. How quickly it goes by. And I am not good at journal writing. So what could a 17-year-old, technically now a senior, write about when taking some moments to truly reflect on my junior year? To start, as I read over that last journal entry, I am reminded of the awkwardness of being around Misha on yearbook day as sophomores. I even comment how crazy it would have been if her husband or baby was there. Perhaps crazy is the wrong word with what happened next. Fast forward just two months from then. It was a typical windy July day in Cedar City, Utah. I was working at Albertsons. It's easy to hate a long Saturday shift making minimum wage, just a few bucks an hour. But not that day. It would become a day to cherish. I happened to glance over from bagging groceries just as the automatic doors opened. In walks one of the most beautiful sights to ever behold. Yes, it's Misha course, and Shelly, and their mom Linda, and Taylor. Before I write any further, 
how could I not light up at the sight of Shelley? Same group for the first girl's choice dance date I ever went on. I was a freshman. She was a senior. We call each other Reese's. Inside story. We may or may not have indulged in copious amounts of Reese's pieces at the all-you-can-eat dessert buffet. Same girl whose little car we piled into after a high school football game. Misha crammed next to me while en route to KB. How would that not be every guy's dream when it's the girl you've always wanted but can't have? But at least your shoulders, arms, hips, and thighs are unintentionally touching. Or were they? Shelly has always been a favorite, and it had been over two years since she graduated and I saw her last. How could I not light up at the sight of Linda, the fun mom who drove us around in the Astro van in search of sprinklers at the college? She is always so nice and smiley. How could I not light up at the sight of Misha, and better yet, have an easy reason to talk to her with her sister and mom there, all easy to talk to? But I saved the best for last. How could I not light up at my first and only sight of Taylor, the most angelic little girl I have ever seen? She didn't seem to just stare in my eyes. It was as if she stared into me. Never experienced anything like this. No brief eye contact like most babies do before looking at everything else. This was different, strange, but incredible. But yes, another interesting encounter with the girl I once wanted to be mine. Now 16, married, her child I was interacting with. I made sure to say a final goodbye when they checked out. How do I possibly use words to convey or describe the thoughts and feelings of how this part of the story ends? It was one thing for Misha's friends to occasionally update me during her pregnancy and when Talia was born. I look back now and it seems weird. I was always in the loop and without asking for any updates. But when Allison turned back to me in English class to be the first to tell me that Talia had passed away the day before, it ushered in a sadness that seemed to linger for many days. It was a sorrow and concern like I've never experienced. Even when pausing to reflect, it still impacts me in the very moment. Why am I affected so much by this? Is it because of my past history with Misha? Is it because I was privileged to meet this little angel through some type of unexplainable encounter and who had a profound impact on me in a matter of a few minutes? Or is it just that I'd feel that way for anyone I have a connection with? Just not sure. Wow, this has been a lot about Misha again. As for the rest of my junior year, here goes. I went to football camp last summer just to chicken out. That marks three seasons of not really playing. Freshman year, broken arm. Sophomore year, kicked off the team partway. Junior year, honestly, I felt a little scared having to practice and play with much bigger players. I still don't get why I even consider doing something I don't enjoy. Friends is always an interesting topic. The usuals have been Rusty and Josh. Sometimes Corey, but I get more and more worried about his choices and things he is getting into. It's always been a sore spot that it's always me having to call anyone to figure out what is going on. I'm always feeling unwanted, yet they seem happy when I'm there, and we always have a great time. A lot of people have always called me shy. I hate that word. It doesn't describe me at all. My parents say the better word is reserved. That's usually the word I use to describe me but I am a completely different person in smaller groups. Nobody dates at all. I see former friends with their friend groups of guys and girls. That's what I want. They clearly have more fun. But I feel stuck between so many cliques and question where I really fit in. Oh, I did get asked by Jessica to go on a double date. Super cute girl. Super fun. One of the only possible replacements for Misha. Haha. She always seems to have a boyfriend. Very flattered, she asked me. But guess what we did? Roller skating. I even slow skated backwards like those many years ago with Misha. I'm two for two with girls loving this. Just many years apart. Oh, the double date included my cousin Tana. She and Chase live with us while my Uncle Trent and Aunt Donna live in Montreal, Canada for three years. Tana is my age, very lively. Everyone seems to love her energy. She is amazing. Chase is two years younger and close friends with a lot of Lindy's guy friends. He can be quirky and frustrating, 
sometimes eats the entire loaf of bread in one sitting, but it's great my parents are helping him have a better environment. I do love that we play high school soccer together. Speaking of soccer, we thought we'd win a lot of games. Embarrassing. We've now won four games in the first three years. Do I dare say maybe next year will finally be a winning season? Oh, forgot to mention that I cut my hair. Super short. No more overhanging bowl cuts or that California flow. No more Pantene, which means no more girls running their fingers through it. What's funny is that even some guys are upset I cut it. Never knew they envied my hair so much. <laughs> Jake's Pantene hair. It's so great. <laughs> you know, I remember dating a guy. <laughs> I dated a guy in college. Jake was serving a mission for our church. And so I had this picture of Jake and this guy knew that Jake like existed in my life. We'll get to all that. Um, but it was so funny because he was like intimidated by his hair, <laughs> by the hair that, that all the girls called the Pantene hair. So funny. So great. It's interesting to get a entire year, <laughs> I guess like a glimpse of Jake's entire year in just like this little snippet. And um, it's interesting the things that are highlighted, right, in the year of time. And of course, I love the highlight story of my sister and my mom and Taylor and I going into Albertsons where he worked. And I love that he went on that dance date with my sister, Shelly. And they, my sister and Jake, they've always had this really special bond. The way that they laugh at each other, the way they get each other, the way they, <laughs> you know, and it's interesting to think about how that started, you know, before Jake and I were ever really serious. That's really fun to reminisce about. I think it's interesting you know, that they had that interaction and that they were then related in the future. I think it's interesting that Jake had such a profound experience with Taylor. And when Taylor passed away, how much it truly affected him. And I remember for me in my life, that always felt so endearing and, and incredibly touching to me. I... I have like, I have the feeling, you know, to ask the questions that we don't really exactly have the answers to. We have feelings towards questions like, are we really connected to the people in our lives, even the ones that will be part of our future in ways that we don't know, you know? <laughs> or is maybe somehow our future really a part of us now? Like, do we feel propelled towards things because it's part of our future? It's technically truly part of our life? <laughs> These are the kind of questions I like thinking about. Do you wonder if we get nudges? towards what's supposed to be in our life or that we drop in in very interesting ways in something that's happening now that gives us a glimpse of our future. Do you ever wonder about that? <laughs> so this, this interaction with Jake and Taylor, I've always pondered it and, and more right? More things that have happened. And I think it's interesting that as people, as humans, that we truly are fascinated by the idea of premonitions, of anything that allows us a sneak peek at the unknown in our life. <laughs> it's so interesting to me. <laughs> so I wanted to dive into this and read you a few definitions of what premonitions are. So first, a premonition is an early warning of future events and is dominated by physical sensations, an inexplicable feeling of unease or excitement that something bad or good 
is about to happen. The act of premonishing or forewarning, hence a previous warning or notification of subsequent events, like previous information. A clairvoyant experience, such as a dream, which resonates with some event in the future. Or a strong intuition that something is about to happen. Anything that is forward propelling. I guess maybe ideas about our future that don't necessarily feel like they come from us. Anything like that I feel like we could call a premonition. Interesting, right? <laughs> and then you, you hopefully are like going back through your life and cataloging things that you might have experienced that are premonitions. I find it fascinating to learn about other people's premonitions because I think it helps us open a window of possibility in our life. You know, maybe what we didn't ever know was possible by seeing someone else's example, all of a sudden we're like, oh, it can work that way. <laughs> so there's a movie called Harriet. I may have talked about it before. It's about Harriet Tubman. And it's just one of my absolute favorite movies of all time. And the reason why is because you get to watch Harriet in these ways. So she, obviously, you, you probably know everything I'm going to tell you, but she helped slaves escape from the South. She was such a force, that woman. And the only way that she was truly able to do it is that she would receive these premonitions. People would be hot on their tail. They would be running through forest, through brush, through swampland. <laughs> and this woman would pause, being able to even hear the dogs at your tail. She would pause and take the time to listen. She would pause to take the time to hear the direction. And when she would open her eyes, she'd say, we have to go left, or we have to go through this, this river, or we have to go through. She just knew which way to go because she stopped to listen. There's a quote by Rumi that says, there's a voice that doesn't use words. Listen. <laughs> there is so much advantage we can gain in life. You know, just like Harriet, being able to be directed in ways when we listen, when we go slow enough to listen. Flashes to our future and things that we are shown, you know, not exactly knowing why we're shown that. And sometimes I've had the experience where I was shown in a moment, but didn't remember until later that that was given to me. Has that ever happened to you? Like, do you remember a few episodes back when Jake visited the field and it was the first time that I had seen him and I was like in the middle of getting a divorce? I had an experience that day that was one like that. So I was under the tree. Remember, Jake comes up to me. He says, hi. He's super excited to see me. And I'm working on some administrative stuff for the youth that I was working with in my church. And I was just sitting underneath that tree and also being a part of the soccer game and being there for my sister. And Jake walks out to the field to talk to his coach. And I went back to my work. And then there was a moment that I looked up and I can still see his khaki shorts, his legs. He has awesome legs. <laughs> and I can see his hand in his pocket. It's like I could see the silhouette of him from the back. And I felt heard the words, you will marry him. And then I went right back to my work and the memory left me, it didn't stay with me. And then at a later time, 
which we'll get to. <laughs> I always wonder if I'm rushing things, but I feel like this fit this theme so much that later on, when it was time to decide if I was supposed to get married to Jake, that memory came to my mind. And it was there in my mind like I had never forgotten it or not been present to it, I guess. <laughs> okay, <laughs> hopefully I'm not losing you. <laughs> hopefully and maybe you've experienced similar things. My mom had one too. When we were in the sixth grade, Jake and I, I think we were in the sixth grade. We were in middle school for sure. And we were at like this honor roll celebration, right? And every kid that was on the honor roll was getting called to the front and being given a cer certificate, you know? And my last name was Cox. And so, you know, I was at the beginning of the alphabet and I went back to the seat with my mom and she said that a friend and I were <laughs> like kind of being rambunctious and we were distracting and stuff when Jake's name was called. But there was a moment where my mom felt heard. That's how I like to describe it. Linda, look up. That's your future son-in-law. What? <laughs> and then, you know, um, I'm pretty sure she forgot it. Let's call her. <laughs> Let's call her. Just a second. Hi, Mama. What's up? How are you? Good. What are you doing? I'm all dad. Oh, I'm sure. I'm in the middle of recording and I just have a question for you. Yeah. <laughs> um, so do you remember your experience when Jake and I were both on the honor roll? And you had a moment where you looked up and you heard the words, Linda, look up, it's your future son-in-law. I mean, I heard his name on now. Just something he said. Look up, it's your future son-in-law. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So here's my question. So I came and I looked up and looked at him. I go, he's a cute boy. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the question, Mom. Did you forget that? Like, did it come back to you later, or did you always remember that? And were you smart enough to keep it to yourself until? you could see the direction things were going. Well, uh, yeah, when you need it, it, it always comes back to you. It's just like a learning moment. Um, you know, I might have thought about it in, in between there several times, you know. Uh -huh. but, and especially when you were with, you know, I was going, no, this isn't the way it's supposed to be, and, and he's not the one, yeah. you know. Ooh, so interesting. So interesting. Wow. <laughs> that one's cool. And that one is interesting in the way that, you know, sometimes we're given things that don't fit, you know, at the time. Oh, that's so good. I love it. <laughs> oh, so, you know, I think it's important to learn how it works for others because it gives us the idea of how it works for us and the wisdom and the why behind why we're given these premonitions or these pulls, you know, these nudges towards things that are supposed to be part of our life, that are supposed to be part of our future. I mean, for Jake to have met Taylor, right? That's incredible. That's incredible. <laughs> and it needed to be in a fashion exactly like it played out. He was just at work in a grocery store. And I like to think that those feelings that he felt that were intense, that those were the premonition, right? The, the strong pulling, the nudges. 
right, that come from a divine source, the voice that doesn't use words. And that voice is still, and it's small, and it whispers. And if our lives are filled with noise all the time, and busyness, or covered up with anything else, then it's difficult to hear, right? We have to create times of inner stillness and quiet so that we can listen. And that's just like taking care of the outer noise. Sometimes there's inner noise as well. And we have to learn how to help quiet the noise on the inside. Some of the things of what creates noise on the inside is really obvious, and sometimes it's not. Sometimes even just our learned patterns create inner noise, right? The way that we can fall into to pits of criticizing ourselves or doing things that we believe we shouldn't, right? Being out of alignment, being out of integrity, all of those types of things, our behaviors, our actions, all those things, even being overworked and tired, all those things create inner noise. And so we just have to make sure that just like Harriet, when it seems like the most ridiculous time to pause and listen, that we know when those times are and we're creating those times so that we can pause and hear. I literally think that is one of the greatest things that we need to learn while we're here on earth. I want to bring up a couple of other things that Jake mentioned, and you'll see how this all ties together in the end. And also just a note, if you hear a lot of rumbling in the background, there's this crazy thunderstorm going on outside. There's no rain yet, <laughs> but there's a lot of thunder. So if you hear that, it's just setting a little bit of ambiance for us, right? Like a little bit of background noise. <laughs> okay, so Jake Jake talks about friends being an interesting topic. You hear that thunder? <laughs> he said it's always been a sore spot. That's always me having to call anyone to figure out what's going on. And he feels unwanted. But yet they seem happy when he's there. And so I want to take this apart. And I want to take apart, you know, nobody dating and Jake calling himself reserved versus being shy. I really want to take this apart. Because first of all, it's, it's an interesting thing to me to watch human behavior and how there are so many people in this world that are just really not good at reaching out. They're not good at creating things. They're not good at reciprocating, you know, inviting other people. I mean, a typical, very good relationship would be, I invite you to do something, you invite me to do something. And actually, it just happens naturally, because we are friends and we think about each other. And we pull each other like into our space because we want each other there, right? But the truth is, is that finding that balance in a relationship is not always <laughs> an easy thing to find, right? And so I think it's an, I think one thing that's interesting is that we always have to evaluate our friendships from the standpoint of if, if you are good at reaching out to other people and you are good at creating and making things happen, and the person on the other side is not good at reciprocating it, I think one of the best things that we can do is just really ask ourselves how we feel when we're with them. Like, is that relationship truly benefiting and helping our life? Or is it something that we're chasing that actually isn't that great for us? That's actually making us feel feelings of being unwanted, but yet we're striving for it. And we're striving and we're actually creating a feeling all the time of something that we don't want. I think it takes a little bit of 
stepping out of your skin or having a conversation like this to be able to look at the broad picture to see what is going on with relationships that we have like this. I have had relationships in my life that made me feel so unsettled because it's exactly what Jake's talking about that I had to just stop inviting. And when I stopped, the relationship stopped. And there is an element that when someone isn't just good at reciprocating, but they love you and they want to be with you and all that stuff, that's an element of just looking at like, well, this is one of my strengths. I don't have a problem doing it. And I really feel fulfilled in this relationship, right? But if you're ever having to question, does this person actually like me? (laughs) Because I'm not sure. (laughs) It's not worth your time. It's not worth your time. Unless it's a family member, it's not worth your time. Family, you know, relationships, that's a, another ball of wax. And we're not talking about that right now (laughs) because I have so many things to say around that too. Um, because you know, for the most part, I would say that my advice with family would be you, that's just what you sign up for. That's what you sign up for. And everybody's going to go through ebbs and flows through those relationships. Unless again, those relationships are hurting you and you need a boundary for some reason. But like I said, that's kind of a little bit in a different camp. When we're talking about friendships, there are a lot of ways to have friendships that fulfill you. Even if you think that all you can see are the friends in front of your face that actually don't treat you well. If that's all you can see and it's not working out for you, spend some time doing something else. Lift your vibration in a different way. Like maybe spend some time alone and heal whatever it is inside of you that's yearning so bad for that relationship. Whatever kind of comes to you, but the most important thing is just to really look at it. Because if you're showing up as a good friend and the other person, and you're, you're inviting, but they're not reciprocating and it's exhausting you, it's not helping you. (laughs) Sometimes we just have to get that memo so that we know that there are other people that we can reach to. Sometimes we have to see the situation for what's actually going on. It's kind of like how Jake could almost see what he wanted. He could see this other group of friends who were having fun. And he's talked to even our kids about this situation as he was growing up. He saw this other group of guys and girls who were hanging out And they had a ton of fun and they always did creative things. And there was a part of him that like longed to be part of that. And I think Jake knows that those people would have gladly been like putting their arms around him and saying, come on, Jake, be part of, you know, what we're doing. But I do know that that was for him. We do get torn with these cliques, especially when we're young especially when we're young. When we're adults, it's it's a lot easier, I think, to to go between lots of friend groups. And I think as adults, it's great for our kids to see that that's possible so that they also can get that it's possible for them. They don't have to be defined by one group or hanging out with just a certain set of people. Kids tend to be really clicky. But the point, the whole point is just evaluating if it's good for you and if it's not, switch gears and go to someone else. Oh, here comes the rain. So you might hear that in the background. It's so great. And the other side of this that I really hope to pull you into is don't ever be discouraged about being a, a starter. And, and if you feel like you're not involved in something, then start something. For all of the feelings that we stand back and hold, that we wish we were a part of something, We're actually creating our life. The stories you tell yourself create your future. And we know that. We talk about that all the time. So don't worry about you being the one that's initiating. Do it because your life needs it. And we need it more today than we've ever needed it because our world is starting to be fashioned in such a way where we spend so much time alone and we don't have as much time with community or friends or, you know, outside of our own selves and making sacrifices to actually be with other people. And so no matter what, 
don't get discouraged. Go and continue to just like start something. The very best thing that you can do when you don't feel involved in something is to go start something. That's the best remedy because you automatically, you know, dampen the idea that you're not included or that you're lonely or that people don't include you. Like we take that away as part of your identity and we shift and we say, nope, I'm creating. Nope, I'm creating. And you find people who are like you and you find more people who hopefully reciprocate, but if they don't, you know, they appreciate you, right? I think this is so simple, but I think we need to talk about it because so many of us are actually in the camp of getting discouraged about it and then being lonely. And I'm not kidding. I think I'm, I'm not really sure, but like based on what I observe from like lots of my friends and lots of um, people that I see, you know, just tons and people I coach, I see so much of it. I see men like married men. I think a, because they don't have a lot of time. I don't. And I think a lot of us don't have a lot of time. I, I that's, that's just what we're up against with our world, the way that it is right now. But I think especially they're just not that good at reaching and we have to be better. So maybe right now, just like think about the thing that you can reach to think about the thing that you can create because the biggest predictor of the actions that we take is what we believe about ourselves. And if we start to believe that, you know, we're the last one picked, (laughs) then that story becomes true. I love how Joe Dispenza says, so your personality is made up of how you think, how you act, and how you feel. That means then, if you want to change your life, your personal reality, that means fundamentally you have to change your personality. That means you have to think about what you've been thinking about and change it. You have to begin to become aware of your unconscious habits and behaviors and modify them. And then... You have to look at certain emotions that keep you anchored to the past and decide if those emotions belong in your future. I was in yoga class today (laughs) and at the very beginning of our class, my instructor had us close our eyes and kind of get centered. And as we were setting an intention for the class, she said, I want you to see in, in your mind that you have a blank sheet of paper in front of you. And you get to write what your future looks like. You just get to write it. And what are you going to write on that piece of paper? And how is it different than your current situation, than your current circumstance? And I love how she encouraged us that she hopes it's different. She hopes it's different. Because... The actions that we take create our personality and our personality creates our personal reality. Remember the episode about who you believe you are determines that the actions that you take. So sometimes we have to take out that blank piece of paper and we have to write what we want it to be like. We have to write down and we actually have to do it. I mean, you can do it in your mind all day long, or you can also challenge yourself and just get out a blank piece of paper every single day and write on it because you're actually challenging yourself to have a different thought than the day before. And most of the time, every single day, all that we do is repeat the thoughts that we had from the day before, which is why we have the same life that we had the day from the day before, right? Over and over, this storm is really picking up. (laughs) It's bringing some intensity to what we're talking about, and I love it. Paul Arden said, Your vision of where or who you want to be is the greatest asset that you have. Challenge yourself. Step into something else. Don't allow the actions of other people to define something about you. About you being 
shy or you being reserved or about you not being wanted or lonely or that you don't date or whatever it is, right? This is a, a, a thing that I, I saw someone doing for other reasons than this, but I thought this was a really cool idea. That is really cool. And it's something you could sit around and do with your family too. You could use an aging tool and you could just put a picture of yourself and let it age you. And then you can see yourself that you will be different in the future. You can actually see that you'll physically be different. And if we can see that we would be different, then somehow we kind of disassociate ourselves of who we are now and we can dream about what that person is in the future. You know, because a lot of times we're way more willing to do things for other people than we are to do them for ourselves. But maybe if we see ourselves as separate than we are now, then we can more easily imagine what we're going to do for her. And in that quiet space, you ask yourself, what would she thank me for? What would she thank me for? What can I do now that she would thank me for? And you write that on the blank piece of paper, right? (laughs) I was doing a little bit of research about our future and our past, and I read something that said for more than a century, the majority of our research and theories held the dogma that, that as people, we were the byproduct of our past. However, the recent research in positive psychology and neuroscience is proving the opposite. It's not the past that drives us, but rather it is the future that pulls us. Ooh, (laughs) isn't that so good? And so now we circle back to the premonitions We circle back to the whisperings, the guidings, and then we also incorporate the future that we're proactively creating. And here's, here's the part that wraps it up for me. That despite having countless future potentials, I mean, remember the choose your own adventure books, you know, it can go many different ways, but our present, the time that we spend right now is ultimately pulled forward by the future that we're most committed to. And I think it's really important to drop in and to spend time in the space of listening and being guided in what that should be. I hope that you've gathered through this episode that So much of creating the future that is best for you also involves listening. And that brings you into a space where you know what you want to write on that blank sheet of paper. And by doing that, you create your story, you create your future, and you have more power than you think you do. I hope you love today's episode and I hope you (laughs) love the rain in the background. It's so great. It's so great to just step outside. I'm really looking forward to just going out there and sitting on the patio and just smelling, you know, how great rain smells. I love it so much. So, Hey, I wanted to give a little shout out to Macy. Macy sent me a message and she had such a astute question that I love so much. And Macy, I hope we answered your question a little bit today. Her question was all about completely being in the moment and being present because she feels torn with creating her future. And maybe the future is something to worry about. And Macy, I want you to know that this episode was naturally unfolding. I checked my messages and this was there waiting for for you. I thought that was really profound. So let that sink in my friend. And then I, I also want you to know that the next episode that we do next week, I'm going to highlight and jump into this question more for you. Okay. So in lieu, or I guess in addition to our short story, because I have, (laughs) I have a really fun one that's ready for you. 
uh, in in lieu of the way it normally is, we're going to talk about this question just a little bit more with the short story than we otherwise would have because you sent this question to me. And I'll read all of you Macy's question next week. And I just want to put it out there that if any of you have a question like Macy, I would totally welcome it. And I would love to answer it for you on the podcast. You can DM me on Facebook or Instagram at my friend Misha. That's M-E-S-H-A. And you can also write an email to hello at myfriendmisha.com. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review the podcast. It does incredible things for the mindset check and allows us to grow and to spread this message to other people. Also, a side note, I made another heart coherence meditation for you. And if you're on my email list, then it's already sitting in your inbox. If you're not and you want to be, then I'll put a link in the comments below and you can click there and get the meditation for yourself. I hope that you're having an incredible season of your life and thank you so much for including me on this part of your journey. I want to leave you with a simple quote from Albert Einstein. He said, imagination is more important than knowledge. And the reason I'm sharing that with you in this episode is because sometimes we have a hard time even picturing what we want our future to be, or we're kind of scared to even write what we want on that blank sheet of paper. So let the words of Albert Einstein sink in that imagination is more important than knowledge. Your ability to dream it is more important than the idea of whether or not it can be. Until next time, my friend. Mm -hmm.